God is amazing. Um, when I wrote this, when I researched this, when I was going over this and coming up with this, um, you know, none of what has happened in the last three quarters of an hour happened, but it is amazing what people have said, what's on people's hearts, the testimonies that people have given, how much is in here of all that. I have been literally blown away sitting here listening to what people have been talking about this morning. So hopefully what I share with you this morning um, is obviously on people's minds and, and will reflect what's gone on already in the service. Um, so let us pray. <coughs> Father God, be with me this morning as I um, open up the book of Acts and look at this passage of Philip um, and his meeting with the Ethiopian. Um, it's a passage um, of hope and of courage and of um, possibilities uh, for us all and so I just pray that you would be with me this morning, um, with us all this morning uh, with this message and I hope and pray that hearts um, continue to stay open and minds alert to the message that is prevalent in your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So at Cobden at the moment we have been reading through the book of Acts. Luke's account of the rise of the early church throughout Jerusalem and into the Gentile world. And as we go through Acts, we are starting to see the story unfold with the good news moving from Judea through Samaria to the ends of the earth. The early church is growing at a great rate. So great, in fact, that the twelve apostles feel swamped by all the work that must be done. To lighten their administrative role they, so they can concentrate on teaching, they choose seven other men who, as Luke puts it, are well respected and who are full of the spirit and wisdom to oversee the feeding of the widows, given particular attention to the Hellenistic Jewish widows who had previously been overlooked. Luke concentrates specifically on two of these men, Stephen and Philip, who together with administrative duties also, he says, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. So powerful was Stephen's preaching that he incurred the wrath of the Jewish leaders who had eventually heard enough to stone him to death. Luke writes after the death of Stephen that a great wave of persecution began that day sweeping over the church in Jerusalem and all of the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. One of the believers who fled to Samaria was Philip. Undeterred by Stephen's martyrdom, Philip continued to preach the gospel and perform amazing miracles, casting out demons and healing the sick and the lame. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard of the revival taking place in Samaria, they sent Peter and John to pray for them so that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And when we get to Acts chapter 8, verse 26, we see that God is not yet finished with Philip. As for Philip, Luke says, an angel of the Lord said to him, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So in true Old Testament style, Philip is visited by an angel of the Lord who tells him to go south to the desert road. He doesn't tell Philip why, he simply says go as angels tend to do. <coughs> and in a show of great faith, Philip doesn't ask why, he simply obeys and he goes. Could he have argued the point with the angel? Well, of course he could. He was doing great work in Samaria and things were really starting to happen. And then suddenly he's being told to go south, into the desert, to travel on a road that nobody travelled on, towards the city of Gaza, that had been destroyed over a hundred years earlier. Why may very well have been on his mind, but if it was, it didn't take long for the why 
to be revealed. Luke 8, verses 27 to 28, we read, So he started out and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Candake, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. This is a fascinating verse and a fascinating meeting for many reasons. First, since he is the treasurer of Ethiopia, we can assume that not only is he wealthy, because he's Ethiopian, he's a black man. Luke's audience would have been fascinated with this since the Ethiopian culture was one that they didn't know very well. And there would have been a very real sense of awe and wonder when they thought about him. Homer's great poet, the Odyssey, describes the far-off Ethiopians, the furthermost of men. Ethiopians were strange people from an exotic land, from the edge of the world. And that's where Luke wants to take us now, to the most unlikely of places, to the most unlikely of meetings, to the ends of the world. Secondly, he's also described as a eunuch. The Greek word for eunuch comes from two words that literally mean bed keeper. Eunuchs were men who had their private parts removed, either through some kind of accident or on purpose through surgery. And I, yes, I use the term surgery very loosely. <coughs> and all the men in the audience cross their legs. <coughs> These men were then chosen as supervisors for the females in a household specifically because they were incapable of having any relationships with them. Deuteronomy 23 sheds even more light on the Jewish attitudes towards eunuchs. If a man's testicles are crushed or his penis cut off, he may not be admitted to the assembly of God. And that's pretty powerful. He may not be admitted to the assembly of God. In Old Testament Israel, I suspect that the only thing worse than being a Gentile or a eunuch, spiritually speaking, was to be both a Gentile and a eunuch. This was doubly condemning, since either condition made you an outcast. So not only did this man represent people from the end of the world, he also represented the very people who had been ostracised and kept away from God because of their very identity. Not only would he have been kept out of the temple, he, would also, he could also not participate in the very tradition that made someone a Jew, a follower of God. He could not be circumcised. You can't circumcise what isn't there to circumcise. So Philip has been sent by an angel to meet with a powerful, rich man from the ends of the earth who under normal circumstances could not be part of the people of God. And if that wasn't weird enough, what the man is doing is even stranger. He's coming back from Jerusalem where he's been worshipping. We know he wouldn't have been worshipping like the Jews would have since he wouldn't have been allowed in the temple. If he was lucky, he would have been allowed into the outer courts with the Gentiles but due to his obvious cultural differences, he may not even have been allowed to go there. Yet worshipping in Jerusalem, he has been. And now he's on his way home, by a disused desert road, reading aloud from the prophet Isaiah. And so finally, we also understand that this man is not only both wealthy, he's also intelligent. It's impressive that he would even have a copy of Isaiah. It may be that it has been purchased for him by the Queen, or he may have had the wherewithal and the money to purchase it himself. We don't know. But it is highly unlikely that it was written in Ethiopian, so he's able to speak several languages. So this is the most strangest of strange characters that Philip could be running into now. But really, this actually fits perfectly into where the story is going. Luke has set it up beautifully. 
He shows us literally the most unlikely of characters to be on the road at this time reading from Isaiah. And then from Luke we read, The Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go over and walk along beside the carriage. Philip ran over and he heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. And Philip asked, Do you understand what you are reading? The man replied, How can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. I like that passage. Philip ran over to the carriage and the man urged him to come up and sit with him. There is no doubt that Philip was guided to this man to this remote desert spot, first by an angel of the Lord and then by the Holy Spirit, a meeting of the Old Testament and the New, which is exactly what we have here with the meeting between Philip and the Ethiopian. The Ethiopian is struggling to understand the Old Testament prophet Isaiah's messianic prophecy which Philip is about to explain to him by revealing the New Testament good news of Jesus. The Ethiopian asks him about a specific verse, presumably the one that he's just been reading, and he asks whether Isaiah is talking about himself or someone else. What a perfect question for someone whose task it is to spread the gospel of Jesus to all the nations of the world. And surely, As they travelled, Philip would have been able to explain the deep significance of Isaiah to the one who it would mean the most, an Ethiopian Gentile eunuch who had, prior to their meeting, never been fully allowed to worship God, the God he so obviously wanted to connect with. Reading from Isaiah 56 verses 3 to 5, Don't let foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord say that the Lord will never let me be part of his people. And don't let the eunuchs say, I'm a dried up tree with no children and no future. For this is what the Lord says. I will bless those eunuchs who keep my Sabbath day holy and who choose to do what pleases me and commits their lives to me. I will give them within my house a memorial and a name far greater than sons and daughters could give. For the name I give them is an everlasting one. It will never disappear. This is the good news that Philip shared with the the Ethiopian. He explained that Jesus was the Holy One of Israel, spoken in chapter 53 of Isaiah, who was wounded for our transgressions. Undoubtedly, he then moved up to chapter 56 to explain that Jesus came into the world as the Son of God to save foreigners and eunuchs and to make them members of his kingdom and his household. The excitement and the joy that the eunuch experiences from Philip's teaching is obvious from Acts 8 verses 36 to 38. As they rode along, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptised? And he ordered the carriage to stop and they went down into the water and Philip baptised him. Finally, possibly after years of rejection and maybe even humiliation in Jerusalem going to worship and pray, the eunuch feels that he is part of God's family. Why can't I be baptised? He shouts. And of course, that's the point of Luke's story here in Acts. Jesus was sent into the world by God to die for men just like him, for people just like us. Jesus secured redemption upon the cross for men exactly like him and for Gentiles just like us. And this man responded to that good news by crying out, I want to be a follower of Christ. Is there anything, anything that will prevent me from being a disciple of Jesus? And of course the answer is no. Miraculously, even though they are in the desert, they come across some water. God will provide. Look, he says, here's some water. Even he doesn't believe it. I want to be baptised. Baptise me now. So both he and Philip get down from the carriage, get into the water 
and the Ethiopian eunuch, beloved of God, is baptised. And Philip, having been chosen and obedient to God's call, disappears. The Bible says he is snatched away by the Spirit of the Lord. Job done. The eunuch's conversion, the first recorded Gentile conversion in the book of Acts, is a crystal clear picture of what God promised to do in Isaiah 600 years before this man was ever born. God's word cannot fail. It was God's intention, not only from the days of Isaiah, but from the creation of the world, to save the outcasts and the foreigners, the sinners and the most unlikely of people, in order to show humanity the great vastness of his love and his mercy, his kindness and his grace. Many also see the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch as a lesson in evangelism. If not for Philip sharing the good news with him, the eunuch would have continued on his way down the road, dazed, confused and ultimately lost. Yet unfortunately, whenever we hear the word evangelism today, we tend to go a bit weak at the knees and we want to run and hide. We think of manic street preachers or tally evangelists and decide that evangelism therefore really isn't for us. In short, I think that we feel that we have to do it all ourselves. We have to put ourselves out there. We will tell people what to think. We will approach complete strangers and hit them with the gospel whether they like it or not. But if the story of Philip and the eunuch teaches us anything at all about evangelism, It's that we don't have to do it ourselves. God will do it for us. As long as we are truly open to his voice and his promptings. On Radio Rima this week, Joanna and I heard an interview with a man who's written a book about the conversations that he's had with God during a difficult time in his life. During the writing of this book, his son's girlfriend asked if she could read it. He was a bit wary since she's not a Christian and he thought that she might think that he was a bit mentally unhinged. But in the end, he agreed that she could read it. A while later she came back to him and he asked her what she thought of the book. He thought she was going to call him nutty or a bit of a fruit loop. Instead, however, she looked at him with all seriousness and said that it was a book that had moved her deeply And it even made her wonder whether she herself had often heard from God and simply dismissed it. As Christians, how many times have we been prompted to go and speak to someone, simply start a conversation and dismiss it? You don't have to go on the offensive when evangelism is mentioned, or worse still, on the attack. We can simply wait for the call of God and then respond answering the questions when they will inevitably come our way, as they will if we are open to God's calling. Maybe instead of gearing ourselves up and then constantly failing and feeling bad about it because we aren't saving people, we should be spending all that energy on being the kind of person of faith, a person like Philip, who God uses to share his good news through. Let us pray.